um, our um, get on your marks, get set, on your mark, get set, cook on our members area of the channel. Uh, I'm just pulling up your your live feed. How are we all? Uh, just thought we'd um, have a bit of a chin wag about um, sobriety, sober, sober, a sober chat. Um, and I can just start talking. And uh, hi, Leo. How are you, darling? Um, it doesn't matter if not if 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 there's if there's not many people here. Hopefully, this will just stay there and it'll be useful for people. Um, what's up, Miss Dark? Tim Reed. Good evening, Tim. Glad you could make it. Um, so yeah, the last week or about a week a week ago, seven, eight, nine, ten, like ten days ago, we uh, we had a bit of a chinwag, didn't we, about the twelve steps? And I was sort of like, I think I was halfway through the steps, um, talking about um, what the twelve steps mean. I think we'd got up to step six, and uh, we were just looking at the ways in which how you know a lot of the language I think around AA and twelve step recovery programs can be a bit a little bit alienating to people. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna uh, try and make sure that I'm on the right Wi-Fi. Sorry, just the feed's a bit blurry. Just one sec. On the right feed. I'm on the right thing. Seven to twelve. Hi hun. Well done for that cooking. Thanks, Julie Hart. Uh, if you wonder why people start refer to cooking in this, it's because we've just come off a members live where I was cooking eggs Benedict really badly in the kitchen. So so before yeah seven seven to twelve step seven to twelve um and we'd literally moved through them, and I was talking about the way in which uh, AA has 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 been a majorly was a majorly and is a majorly important part of my my sobriety, um, especially given that um, I went into it an awful lot for the first four to five years, um, and then to be honest with you, ever since then I've sort of been patchwork. I've had sessions where I go go in for a big period of time, come out go in but I'm always using a little bit like CBT therapy co uh, cognitive behavioral therapy one can take some of the strategies and for me I liken being sober or even your mental health kind of self-care kit I liken it to uh, a toolkit uh, you know you have a toolkit and you have various bits and bobs that are in your toolkit that you use at different times um, Emma McDonald, the 12 steps have helped me through in the past, although you're not a drinker. Yeah, you see, and, and we were also talking last time about the fact that I think there are many ideas at the heart of um, AA and 12-step recovery and so, sober living that the majority of people would, would benefit from. You know, you, you don't have to have a drink problem, though unfortunately it feels like you do have to have a sort of alcoholic drink problem in order to access this stuff. You can access these ideas or these thoughts or these strategies or these tools um, regardless of what circumstances you're in. And as I said last time, you know, group therapy when I was in rehab was something that I think we could all benefit from. It's something that I feel in school would be really good to help kids to uh you know to, to 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 develop empathy and sympathy and um and relate to other people and sometimes sometimes one of the best things about sitting in a group opposite someone else who's also an addict or an alcoholic is that you i mean something that used to happen in 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 group therapy for me was a lot of people would get very angry with other people in the group because they'd get angry with the ways in which different people would be in denial or would deny that their behaviour was having this impact on them or this impact on their partner or this impact on their family. And people at different levels of progress in their sobriety. Hi, Sam JP. Hi, how are you? Um, different people at different levels of their sobriety could pull people up who are in the early days of, say, denial and say, hang on a minute, that's not strictly true. You're kidding yourself. That's not how it works. You're saying this, but actually what you're doing is very selfish and very self-serving. And do you know what I mean? And so I think having different people at different levels of sobriety or, 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 or even if you're not an addict, people in a group therapy session at different levels of progress, let's say, in their lives with different types of experiences in their lives is a really um, important and useful thing. Rachel Hannon, so, so hard to help an addict who does not want to change. And it's, I'm really pleased you've said that, Rachel Hannon. Um, I've often said, and I've often used the phrase that, you know, they said when I was in rehab that a lot of people, they get, get you to stand up. They do a sort of, they do a really hard hitting body count on how many of you are likely to survive, how many of, of you are likely to get well and get better. But one of the things I'd say, I mean, I remember being in rehab and I was in there with someone who had essentially cross addicted to going into rehab. So their addiction 
was going to rehab. And so they would go to repeated different places. And it was the process of going in, cold turkeying, you know, sobering up, starting the process of recovery and then sabotaging that they'd then move on to the next place. And that was almost their kind of addiction. So I think you're absolutely right, Rachel Hannon. There is there is an element of being able to do a certain amount of stuff with things like AA and the 12 steps and, you know, uh, embracing certain rules and tricks in your, in your sober living. But you have to want to get helped. As Sam JP says, you need to want to be helped. Um, and I think you'll find that a lot of people who uh, get sober or become sober or, tr or, or, or start out on their sober journey. And when I say sober, I don't just mean alcohol. It could be sex. It could be gambling. It could be shopping. It could be anything. Whatever, whatever your compulsive behaviour is. It could be anorexia, whatever the compulsion is. Um, you know, sometimes there are people who make the make the soundings of wanting to get better because they realize that for those around them they need to do that in order to actually keep getting what they want and that is a really important distinction you can start to use the language of recovery and getting sober as a way to not get sober isn't that bizarre that's bloody meta isn't it um and i think it's really it's really yeah leave in las vegas that's a brilliant film josh crussell um it's really important to say something as simple as you've got to want to get well in order to get well. And when, when I say that, Tim, you'll understand this, you've got to want to work it. And there's a phrase, you've got to be able to, you've got to be willing to work it. And I think that's essentially what the 12 steps are about. They're a sort of spiritual, and when I say spiritual, I don't mean God sat on a cloud, though it could be for you, your God is God on a cloud. But a spiritual, as in there's something other than just me, there's something beyond just my selfish thinking. Um, and the 12 steps are kind of like a spiritual workout. I'd say, I don't know if you agree, Tim, I would say that they're like a spiritual and emotional um, workout for the soul. And and, and it, it's about you kind of a bit like me doing Joe Wicks every day. It's about moving through them. And OK, you might not religiously move through every one of the 12 steps as we've talked through them on the, you know, check out the previous Sober Chat. But there is there is within them the sort of details of a structured approach to uh, being able to get well and make not only your life happier and more meaningful, but make other people's lives happier and more meaningful too. I mean, one of the most important things to remember though is, um, you know, and I've talked about this a lot, you know, they say often that you need to, A, you need to want to get better in order to get better, get sober. Uh, they also say you need to do it for yourself rather than others. And others. Now, I have struggled with that over the years and I've talked a lot about that. Um, I think it's probably true that my sobriety from here on in on my in my life has to become more about me doing it for myself. But what's got me to 16 years sober has been doing it to protect my daughters and my wife and my family from not necessarily me being, you know, I wasn't I wasn't ever violent or angry or anything like that, but being chaotic being harmful to myself, self-sabotaging, unpredictable, unreliable, um, you know, all those kind of things. So I think, I think, you know, I've often said, and I think you, if you scroll back and listen to many of any of our sort of mental health chats or sobriety chats, I've talked a lot about the fact that for me, that isn't part, that wasn't part of my story. It wasn't for me about getting sober for me. And I think for some, for a lot of people, it isn't about that first, because I think a lot of people's rock bottoms, which is seen, for those of you who don't know what a rock bottom is, rock bottom is seen as that moment where you hit the absolute pay dirt of your life. And it can be different for different people. I think sometimes there's a feeling that you can hear war stories in certain AA meetings and what have you. And sometimes you can come out of them and think, crikey, my story's not as bad as my story's not as bad as their story. Maybe I'm not sort of allowed to be an alcoholic. And I do think there is an element sometimes of uh, you know whether you're a good enough alcoholic or whether and and that doesn't come from AA. That comes from the low self-esteem of the drinker or the addict or the alcoholic. Um, so yeah, so you know I do think I do think it's about doing it for yourself. So rock bottom, 
rock bottom can be a suicidal attempt. Rock bottom could be divorce. Rock bottom could be a lost job. Rock bottom could be coming around in a cell because you were done for drunk driving, as I was. Rock bottom could be your wife telling you, this is it, you're out, you get out, it's the end of the relationship unless you get sober. Rock bottom could be, yeah, you, you, you find yourself in hospital with, uh, with, a, with a, an awful injury or you've blacked out and you can't remember what you did to someone. You know, your rock bottom can very much be something you've done to someone else by accident or indirectly. Uh, Tim, with you, it was your arrest. I mean, yeah, my my arrest for drink driving was a major part of a developing rock bottom that ended up with Nadia saying in no uncertain terms, no, this is the end of it. Um, someone's asking there, is depression part of this? I think, you know, what comes first, chicken or the egg? Um, and... I think it's a bit of both. I mean, you know, certainly for me, I never thought, I, th I think alcohol was definitely a way of managing, masking um, and, and coping with a whole range of emotions that were too intense to sit with, I think. But it wasn't just depression. It was also, I think, I think anxiety can have a massive impact. Social anxiety can have a massive, you know, I went into an industry and a career where you have to meet strangers, interview strangers, work with strangers, talk with strangers, and be in control of the whole gig, you know, when you're directing shows and what have you. And I think for essentially quite a shy kid, I, I liked that and I was drawn to it, but sometimes I think I had to use alcohol to make myself feel like I could do it. And that's not like literally have a drink, then film. It's like become the bigger I am sort of person and gain status and all that kind of bollocks by being the guy that everyone goes for a drink with and da 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 and he's, un he's untouchable. And I used to, I had a period of two years where I was studio directing and I was off, I was caning it every night and, and I was considered the big cheese and it was great fun. We'd all come into the studio, we'd direct five studio shows in the day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, between shows, we'd be having parties in the, you know, you know, so, yeah, you know, I mean, I think, yeah, so rock bottoms, rock bottoms can be anything. Rock bottom is pain every day, 24-7. Rock bottom is suicide. I mean, everyone's rock bottom is their own rock bottom. And I, if I could say one thing to people who hit their rock bottom is don't be ashamed of what your rock bottom is for you. You know, it might not be something acute like a prison cell, an arrest, uh, an injury, a terrible act. It could be a moment of total, total breakdown. It could be a moment where you are sobbing uncontrollably and you've lost all, all hope and meaning and etc. Do you see what I mean? It, it, and it's, I think it's really important to say that. Nadia did give me an ultimatum, Rachel Hannah, and it was an absolute ultimatum and it had to be a clear ultimatum. And she was given that guidance by a therapist who said, you have to give a no uncertain terms, no wriggle room. Sam JP. Mine was realising I was absolutely horrible to my husband if I didn't have a drink. Realising I was treating him badly and was snappy with my kids and wasn't being the best I could be for them. There you go. Um, I would get very sad. I would drink too much. I would always be the last one up. I'd always be up late with, say, Dina and, and, and then I'd get mopey and then I wouldn't go to bed. And then I think it'd be a really good idea to play music at three or four in the morning. And I'd get really depressed about the situation of my life because of the things with Izzy and not seeing enough of my two girls and did it. You know, and the other thing that uh, the addict, I'm sure you'd agree with this, Tim, uh, SAA motto, motto from shame to grace. Absolutely. And the other phrase is poor me, as in poor me, poor me, poor me, poor me a drink. You know, feeling sorry for ourselves. You've got to guard against feeling sorry for yourself. And when we were talking about the steps on the last chat, and we were talking about, you know, step four and making us, uh, you know, a fearful searching inventory of ourselves. You know, one of those things is, you know, recognising where, you know, sometimes I think the addict feels that any attention is better than no attention. And even pity is a good attention, is, is, a, is, is, is a worthy form of attention. And actually, it isn't. It's a very draining form of attention. Um, it's a very unattractive thing. And, uh, and it comes from a very vulnerable place. But I think in the hands of a very sort of wily, sort of manipulative alcoholic, and this is what alcohol and substances do, this is what compulsive addictive behaviour does, is that you'll go to certain lengths to, 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 to fix your craving that you wouldn't normally do. So you'll, you'll, you'll transgress certain moral sort, sort of, you know, guidance or moral boundaries that in the past you would never have, have traversed. And I think that's also another sign of when 
you know you're sliding downwards uh, and you know often it's asked I'm often asked how do you know if you're an alcoholic how do you know if you've got an addict problem well it's when you start to sort of slide down to sort of shameful behavior you know have you have you started doing things or finding yourself in circumstances that you don't want to open up about you don't want to share about you things are becoming more and more secret secrets are swilling everywhere do you know what I mean um so uh alcohol Sarah Watkins and cocaine helped me with my low self-esteem and social anxiety when you were active. Now, you know, yeah, and that's the problem. And I think one of the things that has to be said about alcoholism and addiction and all these things is, and this is something that I try to cradle, which is kind of difficult when you've got kids. You can't just say to kids, don't do it, it's wrong, it's awful, it's only bad. Because they see in their peer groups people having a great time. And to some people, you can have a great time. And it's a really difficult message to say because... Yeah, as Sarah Watkins is, is kind of inferring, you know, sometimes if you don't have a drink, you know, for some people, like for Nadia, having a glass of wine or two of an evening if she's feeling shit is a really nice solution. It's not going to lead to chaos, carnage, degradation of moral boundaries, uh, increasing levels of shame, uh, secrecy uh, and covering up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just going to lead to her just feeling a bit numb, a bit a bit dull and a, a go to bed a bit earlier and fall asleep in front of, you know, married, married at first sight. But for those of us for whom, you know, it goes further than that, that's the point at which you need to start, I don't know, just interrogating what it is you do. So when we got to step seven, we were talking about humbly asking him to remove our shortcomings. This step seven, him being God or a power greater than me power greater than us. And I think I always remember when I came to, when I was in a rehab centre and they essentially said, you're in a mental institute, sir. I was like, yeah. And they said, uh, do you consider yourself to have uh, the, uh, the illness of addiction? And I was like, at that point, I was like, no, no, I just, I, you know, I just, I drink a bit too much. I take drugs a bit too much. I'm, but I'm all right. I mean, I'm just, and they said, you're lying in bed in a mental institute um, and your head, you being in charge of your thoughts, you being in charge, you driving your vehicle has gotten you here. Has it worked? Has just your voice listening, listening to your head worked? It's very hard when you're lying in bed slightly shaky because you've got the DTs and going, yeah, it's really worked. Yeah, I really wanted to be here. Do you know what I mean? And... Uh, and what they were pushing for is you have to reckon, you have to admit your powerlessness, step one and everything. You need to admit that you can't control this thing. You have to accept and admit and confess all the myriad different ways you've tried to manage your drinking. And I hate to say it, you know, things like dry January are part of that. I think for the majority of people, dry, dry January is a really nice circuit breaker. But if you are a person with a fundamental drinking problem that's spiralling out of control and getting worse and getting worse, dry January will only be um, delirium tremors is when you're sort of trying to get rid of the, uh, get rid of the alcohol from your system. Uh, dry January will only be if you are a, an alcoholic or, or an addict on course for, you know, a rock bottom of sorts. It's only going to be like a, it's going to be like a small defence against a tsunami that's going to push push it aside. It's going to delay the inevitable. It's going to be a small moment that delays it. And I think we all know some of those people, I know them, who do dry January and then fucking cane it straight afterwards. I mean, I've written half a play about a character who does precisely that. Just cane it. And, and yet the dry January gives them some sense that they've kind of managed the situation. But in fact, all it's done is it's highlighted the problem. Uh, yeah, DTs are the shakes from withdrawal. So step seven, you humbly ask them to remove our shortcomings. Now, I, I never felt comfortable with the idea of praying and all that kind of stuff. Again, I felt it made me feel a bit kind of awkward. I'm not a conventionally religious person, but I am someone who... Throughout my life, I've been drawn to thoughts about Buddhism. I've been drawn to the idea that there's got to be some other meaning other than just the physicality of what we are. And I think an awful lot of people who have compulsive issues and add addictions are incredibly sensitive people. I think they're incredibly sensitive people who can be incredibly plugged into lots of different sort of way, sort of sound waves or mood waves of, of highs and lows and, and what have you. 
And I think if you accept that you are like that in your life, you can accept that there's something outside of yourself. So when I ever hear this thing, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings, just accept that you're kind of parking this outside of yourself. You're asking the group of other people who might be in recovery that you know that you're going to meet, that you talk to on these kind of chats or see on an Instagram thing or reply to on an Instagram post. You're going to, you're going to, there's a kind of, you can find a community of sorts of similar like-minded people. Step eight, you make a list of people you've harmed and you become willing to make amends to them all. Now, that's really hard. I don't know if anyone remembers, what was that? Um, there used to be a, uh, a series where they, uh, what was the series? An American series where he was basically making amends to everyone he'd wronged in his life. Uh, my name is Earl. My name is Earl. Do you remember that? And this is really important. You know, you make a list of all the people you've done something wrong to. And that for me would be the people I've been unfaithful to, the people I'd harmed. You know, I would put on that list my children for not being there for them, for not being, for being an absent dad to Izzy, to Fleur. You know, all those kind of things. And you make that list. And you share that list. You share that list with your sponsor, with someone else, with someone you trust, with someone you trust. But you make that list. And then you try with step nine to make direct amends to them. And there's a really important sort of little bracketed thing here because my problem with the amends thing sometimes, I spoke to the man Murray, spoke to them, spoke to my girls, both my girls. But here's an important, and here's an important adjunct here, a little kind of codicil, uh, and you've got to, which you've got to kind of sort of strap into step nine. Some addicts or some people who hit what they call the pink cloud of recovery and it's like, yeah, I'm getting my life sorted and this is good and da 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 There can actually be, in the overwhelming sort of overzealous push to sort of make amends to everyone, you've got to try and recognise what part of that is for you and what part of it is actually serving them. And so there is this great little coda seal at the end of step nine which says... Make direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So that means you don't just go out there and say sorry for all this shit that you've done. If if there's the possibility that you could make things even worse, you know, that could be around things like, I don't know, kids that you don't know you've got, all that kind of, do you know what I mean? You, you, you want to ensure that what you say to someone isn't going to make their lives as much more difficult as you then trot off, not that you would trot off, but you know, you've know, got to make sure that you're not just doing it for you, that it's a selfless act. It's not just a selfish act of, of salving your conscious and salving your soul. You've got to make sure that it's within reason, you know. Um, and if you don't want to uh, admit the error of your wrongs or make amends for sort of specifics that you've done, you make then maybe make an apology that's more broader. Make it broader, make it less specific, but make the sentiment complete. Do you see what I mean? Um, step 10, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. This is really important for me and I don't know about you, Tim, and other people in recovery. Step 10 for me is something I do, I try and do every single day. If an argument pops up, and there's a How to Stay Married going up tomorrow about arguments, I will quickly, or, or as quickly as I can, try and take personal inventory, which means, almost like, for me, it's like doing an MRI scan of my intentions and my behaviour, and what did I say today, and what tone of voice did I say, it, and how have I been? I mean, I've been, for example, I've been in a fucking foul mood for the last 24 hours because a major fuck-up happened with the edit of my one of my projects. I mean, a major fuck up that's going to lead to two to three weeks of work. And, and it's fucking aggravated me. Really cross, really frustrated, really annoyed with the people for whom, with whom, it, you know, it sits with, who are responsible. Can't even get my head around sorting it now. But I've been a bit, I've been a bear with a sore head for other members of the household. And so when we're taking my personal inventory, I have to realise, OK, you haven't quite been the nicest you you could have been to them. Do you see what I mean? So taking personal infantry and, and when we were wrong, promptly admitting it. It's really important. And someone just said, I think Wonder Woman just said, it's really frustrating when you say sorry and you're not accepted. Now listen, when you're making direct amends to people, you're not or, or hear them accept your apology. That's not what it's about. It's about making amends without, without reward without any guaranteed rule. I mean, obviously, if they say that's lovely and suddenly there's a kind of union of souls and minds, that's brilliant. But if it doesn't happen, that's not what you're going in for it for. That's not your intention. That's not the target or the destination, really, of doing it. 
Um, 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. That, for me, is meditation. It ain't sitting, kneeling, though it is for some and it is for many. That is that is the potential of meditation. And I would say, you need, and again, <laughs> I'm going to do a 10 here. Take, I'm going to take personal inventory now and say, I don't attend to 11, step 11, enough. Nadia is always banging on at me that more meditation... Uh, and a more handing it over and sort of, you know, manifesting thoughts or putting good vibes out and all that kind of stuff. I struggle with that. I struggle with that in my soul. And that's that's my problem. That's my hang up. And that's something I need to work harder on to get there. But for some people, it's it's praying. Uh, radio silence. That's good. Yeah. Walking meditation. I mean, something else that I do an awful lot, obviously, when we're not in lockdown is I'm, I'm I think the phrase is peripatetic. I do most of my best thinking and my best writing bizarrely when I'm walking and I can I can sort of meditate and get to a place of sorting my emotions out by by movement and by walking and and, and stuff like that uh, and step 12 having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps and the spiritual awakening is if some it might be a euphoric moment I don't know it, it might be I sometimes have heard that in AA meetings like it doesn't work like that for me but uh but I think this is nothing other than realising, oh, you know what? Those 11 steps so far aren't a bad list of ideas. They're kind of, they've got kind of a bit of sense to them. Chop the God out if you're a bit kind of God, shame, God, you know, fearful of that, because some people are. If you're not, that's brilliant. Just jump both feet in. But if you recognise that there is a spiritual contingent to life, if you recognise that there's an emotional contingent to life, um, you know, carrying this message to alcoholics and practicing these principles in our affairs is really keeping your eyes out, keep doing what I'm doing now. This is, in a sense, Tim, is it not, Tim? Tim shares, uh, Tim Reed shares uh, at meetings. Sharing your story, sharing your story uh, is an opportunity for people to hear. It's like I saw someone just said then, thank you for saying that, you know, everyone's rock bottoms are different. It's really important. I mean, one of the, I'm going to share a sort of thought with you right at the end here. One of the most tragic things I've seen in many AA meetings, uh, and I became very good friends with the guy, sadly, many years ago. He was, he was quite a well-known person, no longer with us. And... <sighs> One of one of the one of one of the major issues with reveal, you know, with, with with talking about what you've gone through and revealing your story is that you can sometimes talk about what you've gone through. And because it's so dramatic, it stands out. And this 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 chap, this person really struggled with the fact that their story, as to quote them, was unsensational. There was nothing in it of any particular drama. He felt so outside of things. He felt so alienated. He felt so like he didn't fit in. He felt so disconnected. He felt so ill at ease. And that was why he was a, a, a really, really ferocious alcoholic. And I felt for him because what kept tripping him up in his recovery was this feeling that he wasn't justified or a good enough alcoholic. And if there's one big message I want to sort of put out there, it's that there is no hierarchy of experience here. Yes, of course, it's alcohol and drugs. Lots of people have bad, bad experiences. Yeah, I remember a woman talking about hanging out of a Mercedes, topless, snorting cocaine off a, off a rear view mirror and did it. Yeah, OK. And then I've got mad stories, mad stories. But the point is, is that there's no hierarchy. Whatever has got you to the place of feeling ill at ease and out of sorts is sufficient for you. And if you feel like you need to walk into an AA meeting or you need to reach out to someone like me or to someone else who's in a sober movement or a sober group or you know has sobriety, this is why it's something I always want to talk about and will always say, I am sober, I am a non-drinker. Uh, because people generally do, even at, a, even at a social situation, someone will come over and go, oh, so you don't drink? Oh, God, I know someone who... Do, would you? How would you go about... Da, 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 da. You know, you're offering people roots out. You're offering people roots out. And that's why it's important to talk. And that, for me, is step 12. And so I hope you can see if you combine the last chat with this chat, there are ways and means of folding what could sometimes seem like the 12 steps of AA. You just extrapolate those bits. It becomes a really cool little manifesto, a really cool manifesto. 
and you just need to, and you know, other little phrases that are really important is just make sure your little recovery, I mean, I remember someone saying to me once, make sure your little recovery station is intact, because if your recovery station is intact, and you're doing your inventory and you're making sure you're not messing things up, making sure you don't act alcoholically, da -da 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 -da. if you're doing all of that, theoretically, you can um, be more certain that those around you, they might be going through their own shit, but it's not caused by you. You've removed your contribution to the angst and anxiety from the equation, and that can only be a good thing. And that is another thing of being of service. And for me, it's not said overtly there, but one of the things that comes through the 12 steps is being of service to other people. Yeah. And that is one of the one of the ideas behind just even having these chats. So I hope that I hope that was useful. I'm sorry we got interrupted last time. We will be doing more of these. Um, that has helped me looking at some of your comments. Um, Saskia guy, yeah, we should we should we should walk through the slogans of AA and other twelve step programs. That would be really good. That's a really good idea actually, because there's so many useful ones. Tim, I hope that sort of resonated with you and chimed with some of what you feel is true in your fellowship. Um, and guys, you know, stay safe, stay sober if you can. Every minute counts, every day counts. It's all an achievement, but keep it in the day. And as I say, if there's one big message I want to come out of this today, it's there's no hierarchy of rock bottom. There's no hierarchy of alcoholism or addiction, right? If you feel it, you're it. And if you need help, you need help. And no one's going to prejudge how dramatic or not your reason for getting there is, all right? Okay, guys, stay safe. I think we're going to see you after the Britney documentary. All right, bye. Thank you.